How y'all doing this morning? I wish for your sakes I was a little bit taller so I could see over this, but I apologize. <clears throat> um, he caught us all up, but I, I want to share with you something that God's laid on my heart uh, for about the past seven days. Um, and then I'm going to call him up, so maybe it'll take about ten minutes or so for me to share what I want to share. And I'll try to do it as succinctly as possible. And I'll probably, if I glance over this way, my wife will look at me and say, <laughs> like this. Because I have a tendency to ramble a little bit, like I'm doing now. But um, first of all, I want to thank Pastor Marty, and I want to thank Fellowship of the Hills for allowing us to share today, for supporting us. Uh, we have a couple churches that support us, but you guys um, support us with love, with finances, and you, and you actually... Um, are involved in what we're doing. You got little plaques out up for us and all that kind of stuff, and it's really great. I want to say we're just like you. We're exactly like Pastor Marty. We're exactly like everybody sitting in this room right now. Um, we just happened to answer a call to, to go to Ecuador, and you have a, a, an obligation to answer a call to go into Blairsville or wherever you live or wherever God might call you and share the gospel if Jesus Christ is your Savior. So I want to show you guys something really quickly. About two years ago, we were in Florida. We were back home off the mission field, and we were visiting a friend, a mutual friend of Amy and myself. His name was Josh, and he gave me a Bible. You guys see this Bible? Do you guys see this Bible? Yes. I'm extremely excited to show you this Bible because it has such a beautiful white leather cover on it. And um, right here on the back, it even says, on the spine of it, it says, Holy Bible. And inside of it, it's got a bunch of true words in it, and, and it's, it's, I would say that it's all true. And I think the, the biggest reason I like it is because it has uh, a white leather cover. Let me, let me come out here. Do you see that? You like that white leather cover? Do you guys like this Bible, this white leather cover on this Bible? Pastor Marty, do you like it? What? Excuse me? Does it? Are you sure it does? Does this have a white leather cover or a black leather cover? Wow. Really? Well, praise the Lord that you said it had a black leather cover. Um, because it does. And it would be true to say this has a black leather cover. But for just a moment, you guys went along with me. Some of you guys did. I'm not picking on anybody, but you said, hey, yeah, I like it. Yeah, it's cool. Maybe you thought it was going to go into something else. I don't know, but... The point is, is that it has a black leather cover. And I told you that I loved it because it had a white leather cover. Thank you for pointing out the truth. Thank you for agreeing with the truth. Um, seven days ago, you preached. I'm going to try to make this in 10 minutes. It's probably not going to happen. <laughs> seven days ago, you preached. <clears throat> Does anybody remember what he preached about seven days ago? <laughs> Somebody please raise your hand. What did he? Being the, being the light in darkness. That's an example of being light in darkness and falsehood, pretty much, when it all boils down to it. That's why I use that little example. The, the story is true, though. The, the guy named Josh did give me this Bible. It just happens to be black. Um, the reason I wanted to share this part is because part of the scripture that you used was from Ephesians. It was Ephesians 5, uh, I think he started about verse 8 or so, and um, my lips are going to get dry, so if you see me doing my lips, don't worry, I'm just nervous as I can be. But you used Ephesians 5, and it's really neat because I've been not battling with this for the past seven days, but it's been on my mind, it's been on my heart. Um, I actually really listened to what you were saying last week, and um, it's like it's come full circle because... I don't know if Amy remembers or not, but this, this passage of Scripture in Ephesians was the exact Scriptures that, I, that was dealing with me in my heart when we were preparing to answer the call to Ecuador. We were in a time of affliction and struggle and praying and uh, uh, nearly on the floor puking and praying because we didn't know what God was doing. And we'll get around to that part of the story in a minute, but the fact is is that this scripture is so strong. How many of you have a Bible? I didn't, I didn't get it posted up on the thing. If you've got a Bible or anything you can read the words of the Bible on, get it out and turn to Ephesians very quickly. Ephesians 5, verse 8. 
And you know, I thought, man, I don't want to get up there and piggyback off of anything he did, but I'm telling you, it's not piggybacking off of another preacher what he spoke if it's true. That's what we're all supposed to do. We're supposed to speak truth no matter what the consequences, no matter who's staring at us, no matter what the results of it are. We're supposed to speak truth at all times. Well, I'm going to have to pull my glasses out because I can not see without. And I'm going to read through it as quickly as possible. And I may just stop and point at somebody to pick up where I'm, re where I'm at and continue to reading loudly as you can. It says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you. We're in uh, Ephesians 5, verse 8, if you're not there. Uh, uh, just as, as Jesus Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality and impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness or silly talk or coarse gesturing which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks for this, you know, with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of heaven, in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness. I want to stop right there. It does not say, and this is something that I had to come with grips uh, with, it doesn't say that we were in darkness. What does it say? It says we were darkness. And this is what's so magnificent about it. If it says that we were in darkness, that kind of has an indication that we had some light. But without Jesus Christ, we were darkness. There is a difference in that, guys. And when he calls us out, and he puts his light inside of us, in his truth, the word which he is, Jesus Christ, then we're supposed to let it shine on. We're supposed to let it rock on at all times. And I believe that's what was a, a, a compelling thing for me, for Amy, and for all of us, is that we felt like we were being called. We didn't actually know where we were going. We felt like we were being called to Ecuador. But that didn't come about until about four months after we would prayed and waited and finally said, it's out of our hands. We have no way of knowing where we're going. We don't even speak the language. Um, but I want you to know when saying all that, I'm no more important than you are. He's no more important than you are. If you are a son of God or a daughter of God in Jesus Christ, then you have the same thing inside of you. And it's got to come out. That's what's going to overpower and kill the darkness. Let me go on. It says, but you are now light in the world, in the Lord, walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Now let me ask you a question. It says, all goodness and righteousness and truth. Does it say all goodness and righteousness and mostly truth? Does it say mostly truth or does it say truth? One time, I'm rambling. Amy, I'm rambling. All right. Let me just scoot up. One time, Amy, and I, Amy made brownies for the youth that we were working with, and she told them about all the wonderful ingredients that she had put in it, flour, uh, nuts, and uh, eggs, and all the different things that you put in this to make a cake, sugar, and uh, uh, all kinds of chocolate chips and stuff. And she cooked them up, and she, and she uh, served them to the youth, and they ate them up lickety-split. And they said, you know, guys, I put all those things in there, but I forgot to tell you, I put just a little bit of fermented dog poop in it. <laughs> and all the kids began to spit and sputtle and say, no, no, you didn't. That's exactly the same thing we do when we admit to something being white when it's really black. That's what's going on right now. That's what he was just talking about. I'm about to wrap it up here in just a moment, in about two hours. It says, try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. I love this, for it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible. Remember the word visible. When they are exposed by light, for everything that becomes visible is what? Is light. 
the hardest things I had to come to grip with, you know, I said a prayer a long time ago, and I got baptized back when I was about eight or nine, um, back in Sumter County, Florida. And um, I lived for a long time calling myself a Christian, and I was just running with the world. I got married and was still running with the world, and we were calling ourselves surface Christians. But the fact is, is that I hadn't come to grips that I was darkness, and that God was calling me out of that to not be it anymore. And I came to grips with that I had to give him everything that was inside of me, not just a part of it. And I couldn't continue to go along with the white leather cover. I had to go and say, the cover of the Bible is black and make that decision in my life. And I, I'm sure many of you have made that decision. Maybe many of you are struggling with many. Some of you may not even consider making that complete and final decision, but I pray that nobody in here walks out of here without making that decision to live totally for Christ and do what he says for you to do at all times. It goes on to say, awake, um, you sleeper, and Christ will shine on you. And I think that's the coolest thing because it wasn't until... until I knew who I was and what I needed before Christ could shine on me. Because the rest of it was just my gums bumping and my lips flapping and playing a part and wearing a jersey instead of getting on the field and getting my jersey soiled. Um, so the main thing I want to say to you is this. <clears throat> and I'm going to try to wrap this up. There's so many things I wanted to say and there's just 10 minutes is not long enough. So I think we need to get on to this. But... Um, I've heard it said that uh, if you're not a part of the solution, then you're part of the problem, if not the problem itself. And uh, I believe it to be true. And I believe that the solution to every problem that we are facing right now or that we turn from and ignore, I believe the solution to that is Jesus Christ. How many of you agree with me on that? Amen. And we know, according to the Word of God, that uh, the book, uh, uh, John 1 1 says that in the beginning, who can quote that? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And do you guys know that that Word became flesh and came and dwelt among us and died on the cross for us? Do you guys know that? This is what changed my life was surrendering, admitting that I was a sinner. And I started reading this. I actually started teaching a Bible class with my wife. I'm going, I actually started doing that. And I realized that I actually had to start reading the Bible. And that's what started to change my life. And I've heard him say it since I've been here for a few weeks. He talks about reading the Bible. Don't just come here and listen to him for 30 minutes or whatever on a Sunday. But dig it open, crack it open. And then poured inside. He was talking to kids this morning about being sheep and about the good pastor and about what sheep eat. And they said, they eat grass. And I said, yeah, they also eat the word of God. And it's inside of and it nourishes them. Okay. Um, does anybody know what the word compromise is or what it means? Compromise. Compromise is a good word. It's also a bad word, depending on how it's being used. I've been married to Amy for 21 years, 21 and a half years now. And in our marriage, we've had to compromise with one another. We've had to make concessions. And um, in that sense, it's good. But compromising on the fact that the Bible, is, the Bible cover is white, and we know it's black. Doing that kind of compromise with what we see happening in the world today is not good. Compromise means to make agreement with. It means to come to terms or make concessions. And um, quite frankly, I see it coming like a, like a ton of bricks. It's being forced on us every single day. If you call yourself a follower of Christ, you can tell that things are being forced on us every day. They're being used to crush our conscience, our conviction. And we're supposed to say, yeah, that is a pretty white leather cover on that Bible. 
when in fact it's not white at all. It's black. So we have to decide in our hearts and make a commitment to, um, to speak out. How many, and I'm stopping. I am right now. I see your hand up there. How many of you have ever heard, do you guys mind listening to me for just another second? How many of you have ever heard the story of the emperor's new clothes? How many have you have not heard the story of the emperor's new clothes? For you six or seven or however many there are, I'm going to say it real quick. There was this emperor. He was full of pride. He was pompous, and he loved to dress up in new clothes and sport them around in front of all the subjects in his kingdom. Word got around what he liked to do. I mean, that's what he lived for, basically. And word got around, and these two swindlers came along, and they passed themselves off to the, off to the king as weavers. And they made a, set up a meeting with the, with the king, or with the emperor, and they came up to him and he says, King, we have developed this, uh, this thread, this material, that has a magical power, and anyone who can't see it is A, either not fit for their position in your kingdom, or they're hopelessly stupid. And the king looks at it, and he says, in his heart and in his mind, he says, I don't see a thing. But to them, he says, oh, that is so magnificent and beautiful, because he didn't want to appear to be stupid, hopelessly stupid, or unfit for his position. What would have made him fit for his position is to call out right there and say, I don't see a thing. But he didn't. So they made him a suit. They said, we're going to make you a suit and you're going to be able to walk in a procession through town and show off this suit to all your subjects in your kingdom. And he said, yes, I will. He called all of his, his priests and his magistrates and all the important people in the, in the, in the, uh, in the kingdom there. And he brought them together to see the, what the weavers were making for him. And they all came in and they looked at it. And up on the loom where they were supposed to be making it, they looked at it and they didn't see anything. And they had already heard about all this. And uh, they looked at it and they said, oh, well, it's quite beautiful. I think it'll look magnificent on you as you're parading it through town in front of all the people. All the people had heard of it as well. So time comes. The, the, the two guys, they say, hey, king, you're going to have to take off your clothes. Sorry, bud. We're going to put the suit on you. Take off your clothes. We're going to put the suit on you. So they acted like they were putting the suit on. And they started blowing the trumpets and all the horns and bells and whistles. And they got the parade ready, and he walks right through town. And all the people know about what's going on in the town. They've heard. They caught wind of it. And they're all looking. And they look this way to the person next to them. They look this way. They look at the king, who's obviously... Um, you know what he is. <laughs> and nobody's saying a thing. And then they start saying, oh, the clothes are so magnificent. We love your new suit. And then all of a sudden he gets down to the end of the parade. And there's one young man who yells out and points his finger. And he says, Emperor, you are naked. The people around him say, shh, hush, hush. He said, no, he's naked. I can see that he is naked. Let us not do the same thing right now, you guys. We know what the truth is. We know that it's coming. We know that it's going to continue to escalate. But we know for a fact that the cover of this Bible is black. It is not white. And it doesn't matter what a man or a woman says to you. If you know the truth, you're called to stand on it. <clears throat> and I'm not saying all this to discourage anybody. I'm saying it to encourage you. And as a matter of fact, when rubber meets the road, when it's time to be in a trial or a test and to have courage, it's going to be hot. There's no doubt. Prepare your minds and your hearts to face what's coming with truth and with light. I'm finished. I'm going to read three verses, and then I'm going to call my wife and my kids up here. And I want to leave this with you. And I didn't do this exactly how I wanted to, but hey, things work out because God's in control. Psalm 119 says this. You got a Bible you want to flip there? That's cool. You can just listen. It says... 
The joyful are people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. The joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. They do not compromise with evil and they walk on only his paths. You have charged us to keep your commandments carefully. Oh, that my actions would consistently reflect your decrees. Then I would not be ashamed when I compare my life with your commands. As I learn of your righteousness, I will thank you by living as I should. I will obey your decrees. Please don't give up on me. That should be our prayer. I want to say that Jesus Christ is my Savior. Jesus Christ. I don't like getting in front of people, y'all. I don't like going to another country and not knowing the language and trying to do what I do. It's not, it's not that, it, that, it, that I just woke up one day and I said, I'm going. It's not easy. It's not easy for you. It's not e easy for us to share the gospel, but that's what we're called to do. You don't have to get on a plane and fly over there to share the gospel. We should actually not even be coming here. We should be kicking those doors down and going outside and telling people about Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what we're called to do. And we're called not to compromise, as his word says. Jesus Christ is the way, and he's the truth, and he's the life. And that's the only way. Okay? Amy, you guys come up here. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. My lips are dry. Is there any water around this place? I'm going to walk back here real quick. We were scheduled to share... Um, we were scheduled to share about five weeks ago um, with all the other missions, um, missionaries and missions that were being shared here at the church, but it's obvious that we couldn't because Malachi didn't have that in his plans, neither did God. Um, it was an extreme blessing um, that we came home and um, we're able to have him and Amy and here safe. And so I'm going to, is the slideshow going to come on? Oh, yeah, let me introduce. This is Abigail. Abigail just had a birthday. I, want to, I also want to say something very quickly. Um, sometimes they're called missions kids, but I want to actually say that they're actually missionaries. They have ju done just as much as I have over there. They've run classes. They've done all kinds of things, and, and they are missionaries as well. They're not just missionary kids, and our family unit has been a big blessing over there as far as missions work. This is Madeline. Um, Abigail's, Abigail's 14, by the way. Madeline's about to turn 16 in, in uh, July. So that's coming up pretty swiftly, too. She's got her uh, learner's permit, so watch out. <laughs> All right. And this is Amy. I'm not going to tell you how old she is. She's a little bit younger than me. Okay, she said she don't care. Are you 41 or 40? I'm 40. She's 40 years old. <laughs> okay. Um, Elijah's upstairs in the, in the class with the kids, and uh, he's six, about to be seven. This Malachi, he's five weeks. So I'm going to hand this microphone to you. Thank you for letting us get up and share. I want to start by saying um, Eric and I kind of prepared separately, and he asked me to share. Abigail, go back and stop it, please, on, on that couple that it just showed. Um, that couple is one of the ways that God one of the people, that couples, that God used to prepare us to go on the mission field. Um, I am a left-brained person. I like my lists. When Eric married me, bless his heart, I had a one-year, a five-year, a 10-year, and a 25-year plan pre-written. <laughs> I gave that to him before he married me. Um, so when he talks about compromise, um, we have done a lot of it. And so because I am so, um, I like things tangible and orderly, God calling us on the mission field has, has been difficult for all of us, but I'm, I'm going to speak for a few minutes about um, myself. I think that most people, Christians, want to see missionaries succeed. And this fellowship has been wonderful in praying for us and lifting us up before the Lord and caring for us. But across the board, I see a habit, a tendency for people in the congregation to put the pastors and the missionaries on some different plane. Um, somehow you imagine that we're different. 
Some of you imagine that we're different and we're on a pedestal. Some of you, um, it's easy to see our flaws. <laughs> and so, and you like to kick us off the pedestal. Um, <laughs> but, but you like to differentiate us and them. And, and sometimes that can be confusing and hurtful. But I've come to this idea that may be right or wrong, I don't know, but I'll share it with you and you decide. If we are different than you, then somehow it makes it easier for you to excuse yourself not to do what God has called you to do. You can say, they're different, somehow, we don't know, but somehow they're different, and so they are called to go into all the world. I'm just a normal person, I'm not called to do that. But that's not true. Madeline was in school in her Bible class, and the teacher was giving a lecture, and she unwittingly um, created a rift between Madeline and the students by setting Madeline apart. And she said, Madeline, how do your parents deal with the stress? And Madeline was honest. She said, well, they cry. <laughs> and the teacher said, no, really. And so Madeline gave the canned missionary answer. Well, they seek guidance from pastors and wise counsel and their friends. And the teacher liked that answer. And she said, oh, thank you, Madeline. <laughs> Abigail needed help studying her Bible verses for her Bible class, and she asked one of the kids to help her study. And the kids looked at her and said, well, you don't need us to help you study. You're a missionary kid. You already know the Bible. And Abigail said, I'm 14. You think I know the whole Bible? I need help studying my Bible verse for today's test. But somehow, even at that young age, those kids had already set her apart and said, well, she must already know the Bible. Well, I don't know. Maybe she got it through the placenta, you know, when she was in utero, that somehow she knows the Bible. We are no different than you. We struggle. Um, we have stress. We have teenagers, just like y'all have had teenagers, some of you, except ours are in another country with another language, so it's another layer of stress. So when you see those words in the Bible in your mind, don't say that's them. Recognize that that's you. He might not call you to a foreign land, but he still calls you. And God used this couple. I was learning the Bible with the kids, and um, we went to this Georgia Mountain Fair. They have a free kids day during the day, and we were homeschooling, so I was able to take the girls. And as we walked around, we saw the people treating the carnival workers poorly. They were invisible or, or beneath them. And um, I was raised where you don't go near the carnies, you stay away from them, you stay away from that area. Um, but we did see that they were being treated poorly, and, and the girls noticed and commented on it. And I started feeling convicted about that. I had been guilty of it myself, and we saw it. And how was I going to tell my kids that God sees us all equal if we're going to treat them beneath us? And um, I felt like we needed to go give them water. They were just so hot and thirsty, and they couldn't even go get water. And I felt convicted about that. I didn't want to go because I'm scared of carnies. And I didn't really want to go rub shoulders with them, to be quite honest with you. And um, so I, I kind of made this deal with God because my husband loves me, and he's a lot like my dad. And my dad would never approve for me to go take my two precious daughters, six and four, to work with carnies for a whole week. And so I said, okay, God, I'll go minister to these carnival workers if Eric says I can. Because <laughs> I know Eric's not going to do that. <laughs> and so I went to Eric, and I said, Eric, this is what I feel like, but I know it's, it's nonsense, and, and I just need to run it by you. And Eric said, no, you need to do it if God told you to do it. And so I was mad at Eric, and I was mad at God. <laughs> and so I said, okay, God, well, um, I don't have coolers. I don't have water. I don't have ice. I don't have all this stuff. And we'll go to the church and ask. So I knew that um, we weren't very involved in the church at this time. We were a few bitch warmers, you know. And, um, but I went to the pastor and told him my idea, and he said, you can have all the water and ice and coolers that you need. <laughs> It's still not what I wanted to do, and so I said, okay, God, I'll, I'll do it. So I loaded up the ice, the water, the coolers, the two girls, and we went to the Georgia Mountain Fair, and we pulled up, and we were, we were um, very poor at the time. And I said, God, I have money to get in and park one day, and I have um, maybe if I use all the quarters between the seat cushions, entry fee to get into the park one day. But we can't do this every day, and you're going to have to do this. If you want me to do it, and you make my husband say yes, and you make the pastor say yes, and you want me to do this with my kids, you're going to have to do this. And I didn't really want to do it. I guess you can tell by now. I didn't really want to do this. And um, we pulled up to the gate, and I told the 
parking lot attendant person what we were doing, and he said, you can park every day for free. <laughs> <laughs> so we parked, and we prayed, and um, we went up to the gate. I think there were like four gates open, and um, any, mini miny, mo, you're it. And we went, and I told the man what we were doing, and he said, oh, I'm a pastor. Come through my gate every day. You can get him for free. <laughs> and so every day for a week, um, the girls were six and four, or seven and five, seven and five, and they would stand on the cooler. We went to every ride. They would stand on the cooler and tell a story about the water, um, the woman at the well, the living water, just uh, walking on water, all the water stories. Every day was a new one. And if they wanted a free bottle of water, they had to listen to our story. And some of them listened to the stories, and some of them said, we don't want to hear about your God. And we um, met a bunch of really interesting people, a pastor's son that was running from God, um, a couple who was trying to raise money to make a Christian album. And they would yell, hey, what a lady, every time they would see us coming. And um, I'm kind of a quiet person, and that really made me uncomfortable being yelled at by a loud black woman across the fairgrounds. <laughs> <laughs> and we noticed that the people attending the fair would um, shun us because they thought we were somehow associated with the Carnies. Uh, but it was a wonderful experience, and we saw God's hand and his provision over and over again. Um, at the end of it, they ended up needing help. Um, God used Eric and our children and our family, and we don't have time to go through all that. But sometimes God asks us to do something we don't want to do. You have to do it anyway if you want those blessings that come with it. Um, and sometimes he asks us to do things that make us afraid, like working with carnivore workers or uncomfortable because you're going to be treated yucky because you're out rubbing shoulders with yucky people. But Jesus did all those things. He hung out with yucky people, and he did scary things. And if we're his followers, then he calls us to do the same. Thank you. We, we actually have the same uh, <clears throat> phone number on our magic jack over in Ecuador. 706-897-5649. We've had it for a long time now. And it's a number we had when we were in Blairsville at that time. And the phone rang this past year while we were over there. And a lady said, is Miss Amy there? I was like, who is this? I'm like, yeah, hold on just a minute. And as I was walking to tell Amy to come to the phone, I realized who it was. It was Miss Lori. That's Lori and Chase, by the way. That's their names. And Miss Lori called Amy. And asked her for prayer. You never know whose life you're going to impact by doing what God tells you. I had really nothing to do with all that. But God did. He used her and he used my kids. And it's just something that Amy always looks back at to help remind us that we're supposed to listen to God. Anyhow, if you would, just go ahead and... This is going to just run right through, so we're just going to kind of... You get a microphone right there, by the way. And, um, and uh, we'll talk about it as, maybe as the pictures come up or whatever. Our ministry is called So All May Know. And... Um, our objective is to tell people about Jesus Christ and to share the word of God with them and help disciple people. We're in South America. That little country that circled there, the tiny one purple one, is Ecuador. And this is a bigger picture of it. And the line from Aswai, uh, the province of Aswai and uh, Napo, are where we work. These are actually some places in um, the jungle where we work. Misawaji, Shiripuno, Pucachita, Bella Vista, and so on and so forth. You can see them. And... Um, if I try to keep up with the pictures, I'm just going to ramble along. So, Amy, you want to say some things? The first two and a half years, we worked in the jungle. We had various ministries from teaching in an indigenous school with a Quechua to holding Bible and English classes in our home, uh, baseball. We had a baby ministry. That baby's named Madeline, after Madeline, and this is that family's home. Um, we loved, loved, loved the time that God used us in the jungle. And Eric still goes back every month for um, five to seven days, working with the pastors there in the jungle with the aquaponics and supporting these indigenous churches. Our goal 
as tempting as it is, is not to go and make a, a home for ourselves and settle in and be comfortable, but to equip the locals and the indigenous pastors and just to support them, to help them get their footing and to, to move forward. Uh, currently, we are living in Paute, and we work in Asogas and Paute. Asogas is a, um, this is a different type of people that live there. Um, they're the mountain Sierra people, beautiful people as well. Um, we spend a lot of time as a family unit building relationships with people and with their families. And um, we find in turn that that helps us in the community to build other relationships, have Bible studies, lead people to the Lord, lead them to reading the Word of God, and um, then sharing it themselves. When they start to invite you into their home and they say, oh, there's Elijah with the guinea pigs. They fed him one for dinner that night. He refused to eat it because he'd been playing with them. And when the elderly women say, come, I'm going to teach your daughters how to make kumitas, and um, we grind the corn by hand, and the girls, the girls do those things, um, it, it lets us know that we are becoming a part of their lives and community and that they're going to trust us enough to listen to God's word. So many times people come in and they, they yell it on, from their bus as they're there for a few days and move on. And some of these people groups, it takes a year for them to smile at us. Our first year, no one smiled at us. It took a year. So it takes a while to build those relationships where they're going to trust you enough to listen to what you have to say. Um, when we got to Paute, we felt like the Lord was calling us to find a place to open up as a ministry center, not a church, but a place where people could come and drink a cup of coffee, sit down, hang out. We, we have movie nights. We have family game nights where we always share devotionals. And um, it's just a place where people can actually come and not, be, um, not feel like they're at a church, but it always ends up going that direction of talking about the gospel. Um, we had a guy show us a couple places, and he finally said, hey, I know of another place, because we saw some places that were small, and they were really expensive, and he said, I know of a discotheque. <laughs> and um, I said, a discotheque? Yeah, man, let's go see it. So we went and saw it, and um, it happened to be the right size, and um, through your support and everything like that, and your prayers, we have movie nights and game nights where we show Christian movies and, uh, in, in their language, and um, it's just a community-type thing, and it's a safe place for them to come. And um, everything's predominantly Catholic right there where we're at, mixed with animism. So it's a place where they can come and actually start being able to read the Word and have an interest in reading in the Word. And, and uh, we have uh, English classes and Bible classes, and it's, it's an exceptionally fun time. There's a couple nuns in the class that, that, I, that I teach. Um, it's a trip reading the Word with them because they'll say something. I'll say, let's go look at this scripture, and we're just back and forth. And sometimes we don't even get to the English part of the classes. <clears throat> And the children's English classes have been a big hit, where we play games and learn English, but we use the Bible and Bible stories to do that. So when we're learning about trees and grass, when he made the trees and the grass, God did. Um, and it's enabling us to reach into those families through their children, because we have the children in class, and we give the kids love and snacks and fun and, and English, which they really value. But then when it comes time for movie night and game night, they bring their families and their extended families. And then they're there while Eric shares the devotional and the, and the word of God again. So we're able to reach out to the families. Madeline and Abigail have been a big help with that because my Spanish, I am able to converse, but I, I don't speak proper Spanish. I say, I go to the store yesterday instead of I went to the store. And Madeline and Abigail are there to help me and correct me and help me communicate to the kids. Okay. Um, the name of it is SIP 91, and uh, we decided to call it SIP 91. The 91 part is, of course, from Psalm 91. Uh, the SIP part is um, Saber Instrucciones Perfecta, which means the word Saber is more along the lines of knowing, but more intimately. Conocer would be to know, but saber is related to the word sabor, which is to taste. And that's what we want people to do, is we want them to sip on it little by little and taste the goodness of what God has to offer us. And um, I can say that when Amy, it was actually Amy's idea to, to try to open up a little cafe, and I was like, no, we, I don't know about all that, but it, it has actually turned out to be kind of a success. So. 
Let's talk about that part right there. Um, we have not only the English classes for adults and children, but we have Spanish classes for the um, English-speaking retirees in the area. And they've come in, and I'll hear them coming down the steps. Yeah, she's a Christian, but she's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a compliment. They come, and it's got the, the scripture around it, and we, you know, talk about God as it pertains to the lessons. We don't shove it down their throat. So it's amazing the people God have, has brought. We've hosted um, French, Australian, all sorts of people in our home where somehow God leads them and they're able to come and stay with us, eat with us, fellowship with us as we share the word with them. This is a park ministry where we go to the park and we do, um, we're actually partners with the local church there and we do this with them because they kind of speak Spanish and stuff, so that helps. Um, we do the face paint, we do the puppet shows in Spanish, which are, you know, Bible stories and like that kind of thing. So that's what all those pictures are. So when teams come from the United States or wherever, we've had um, hosted a Mexican doctor once, but they'll come and they'll help us with the face painting and the storytelling and playing soccer and games, and they're intrigued by this group of foreigners, and so they'll come, and as they come, the local church is there with us, and they're inviting them to church and sharing the gospel. It's, it's a wonderful outreach. Now, we go to the orphanage once a week. I'll tell you my part in the orphanage. I've got some tools over there in a bag, and usually I go in, there's a bunch, we call them tias there. And uh, Tia Mari, Tia means aunt, and uh, Tia Mari is like the head lady at the orphanage as far as the ladies who are directly involved with the, uh, the children and stuff. And Tia Mari, every time I go, of course the girls and Amy, they always do Bible crafts and activities and songs and all that, but I get stuck uh, with a honeydew list from Tia Mari about that long. I need you to fix this pipe. I need you to fix this uh, shelf. I need you to do this. Oh, we need you to clean that room out. We need you to build a wall. So we brought a team to build a wall. We need you to do this. We need you to do that. So um, I love it. It's fun. You know, I'm not a really like a skilled craftsman or anything, but I know enough to go in and do little stuff. So it's really great to be able to do that. And they love us. They love the kids. We find out sometimes that just go in there and... Um, Asking them, hey, can we fold clothes for you? Or can we do the laundry for you? Is a tremendous blessing for them because they have to do it day in and day out for like 40 kids or something like that. So that's a good thing too. Tell them about your little boy. Oh, um, there was a, a little kid. I guess he was about one and a half maybe. Um, his name was Jose. And um, we would go every week. And I, I don't know, I just really like this little kid and kind of like me too. And um, we, I would try and spend time with him and hold him while we told the Bible stories and stuff. And um, one day we went and he was gone. Anyhow. Um, Talk about the cameras. Talking about what? Cameras. Cameras. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, through you guys' support, we were able to get them cameras. The government was really hitting them hard about getting some uh, security cameras up. And um, thanks to you guys, we were able to get the cameras there, shipped over there. I was, um, I'm not a cameraman or anything like that, but I was able to uh, mount them and put them up. And, and uh, now they're, they're in, uh, they're in uh, accordance with the laws that they have to follow by. So um, we just try to help out in any way we can. Um, as you can tell, sometimes the kids come in and you get attached to them and then all of a sudden they're going out again. So, uh, But the main thing is to go and love them like Christ loved me and like Christ loves us, all of us, and to share with them and, and um, leave it in God's hands at that point. When we can't find Madeline, she's upstairs with the babies. When we can't find Abigail, the Tia's have her in the kitchen working. And that's been a wonderful thing because Abigail's cooked all sorts of new dishes for us. Um, this says aquaponics. Aquaponics is like hydroponics where you um, put fish in, uh, and hydroponics together and the fish poo fertilizes the plants and so on and so forth. I'm still learning about it as, as I go, but um, this is a way that I try to help Pastor Ramiro, who's actually an indigenous man up from the Sierra, way up in Otavalo, who had been called to the jungle. 
and um, has a church plant out there at Bela Vista, and we still go out there, and I was trying to learn about the system so that I could teach him the concepts of it, and so that we could work together on trying to incorporate the kind of materials that they could get in the jungle using bamboo and different things like that, and things that were easily accessible, not expensive. And um, this, that's what this is all about. We get to eat from it. We share with people in the community. A lot of the people in the community of Paute now actually come and say, we want you to teach us about this as well, even though the soil in Paute is very good. The soil in the jungle is, is not. This is Bella Vista. Yeah, that's actually uh, the beginnings of an aquaponic system we were putting in a, a pit there. <laughs> We, we go down to Bella Vista about once a month, and um, we've been taking teams, you know, a few times. Um, that's the trail up to where the water tank that we brought is. Um, they, they, their spring went dry, and so we brought them that, and it's able to flow down through that, and it's going to be able to help with the aquaponics. Um, this is their church that we actually got to help build, so that was pretty cool. That's the tank. Eric was focusing on helping them with their aquaponics, but when he got ready to go with Pastor to install it, their spring went dry. And so we were able to raise enough funds to get them a tank and enough black tubing that they could find another spring on someone else's property. And then, I'm not sure how the guys managed to do it, but the, the little village has water again. Um, where the spring is, and it's up the side of a mountain. If you look at that right there, that's, stop that if you would. This is cool. Pastor Romero has a cool story about this, um, and he was telling it. Um, it looks like a little pool of water, and it's actually a concrete wall uh, surrounding the, um, the spring. And um, on this side of it is water, and on this side of it is just a straight drop down, really, really steep. And um, we had some people out there, and we were showing them and everything like that. And I asked, I asked Pastor Romero, I said, Romero, tell us about the about this uh, situation right here. Tell us, he was out there standing on the wall of that little pool, this little concrete wall. And, and I said, tell us about that. And he says, well, I'm standing on the wall of decision. And everybody looks and I said, well, what's the wall of decision? He says, well, we bring the people up here and we say, you can either repent of your sins and get baptized <laughs> and get dunked or we're gonna throw you off the edge. <laughs> And anyhow, that was just a funny story, and he likes telling it. He laughs at himself as well. So. They, don't, they don't do that. It was just a funny story. <laughs> they don't do that. <laughs> Sorry. Anyhow, say something, maybe. I think it's almost finished. Um, Bella Vista is an indigenous community, and we've learned so much and received so much love from them. Well, we went and shared... And um, after the service, all the people left, and they were running around in the woods and the swamps and along the rivers. There's the wall of decision. And uh, we couldn't figure out what they were doing. And finally, they were all cheering, and they would gotten this little frog. And um, they took the frog, and they wrapped it in leaves, and they smoked it, and they brought it to us because they didn't want us to leave hungry. And they eat the whole frog. And so we, of course, took a little bit of the frog each. And as we've learned, um, everyone there shares everything. So you never eat all of what they give you. You just take a little bit and then you share. And they ate all of the frog, um, not just the legs like they do in Florida. Um, they ate all the frog and they don't waste it. Um, we've eaten a lot of interesting things from frogs to snails to guinea pigs. Um, but one of the most beautiful things is the way they share. The kids might have just a tiny bit of food in the morning. Not everybody has breakfast when you teach. And they'll come in with this tiny bit, and they'll take one piece, and they'll pass it around. So everybody has some, um, including us. And so when foreigners come, and they have a bag of chips, and, you know, they'll be eating their chips, and they eat the chips, and they throw it away. And the people will just sit there and look at each other, because they don't even share with their own people, much less with them. It's just such a cultural difference. It's a beautiful thing that, that um, God's love is everywhere even when they have lost the ability to discern where that love came from. And so we can use that as an opportunity to say that's how he wants you to be. Um, and that, that love is, is God's love. You just have to know the source now. And just on a quick note, back to the, to the beginning before we ever went, I was telling you that Amy and I were really praying a lot about it. The whole family was. It was, it was a rough, rough time. Um, but we sought counsel, and the counsel told us, if it's of God, he'll make it known to you. And that's what I would say to you. If God's calling you to do something, and you're struggling with it, he's going to make it known to you. Wait. 
He'll tell you in his time. But don't run away from it. And lo and behold, we waited for about four months. We didn't know where we were going. We just felt like we were supposed to be going to Ecuador. And Amy received an email from a lady from down in Florida. And she was part of an organization called Jungle Kids for Christ. And she said, uh, you know, I got your name from this guy. We didn't know who the guy's name was. And um, we need two teachers in the jungle. And that was four months after a long period of internal and mental struggle on we our family. Huh? We never met her. Yeah, we never met her. We, we didn't solicit it. So what I'm trying to say is this. God's going to make stuff known to you. We have to be patient. We have to trust him. And we certainly do not need to compromise with the darkness of this world. And we thank you all for supporting us. Over. It's not over? Is it over? Is it? Yeah, that little red dot's at the end, so. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you all for letting us share with you all. Appreciate it.